100 years ago, Henry Norman Siraj began sharing his coffee with a small Louisiana community. Concentrating on quality and flavor, the small company grew from that one man into a corporation of over 800 employees. Led by the same family, striving to serve an enticing cup of coffee and connecting with people all around them. His product he called Community. Community coffee in honor of all the neighbors and everyone who had been so good to him up here in Baton Rouge. That blend of flavor and service has intrigued and captivated generations. The magic in our name today is that community does mean something. Uh, to, in today's time, people are seeking community. They're seeking relationships. The sense of community is a very powerful thing. In the early 1900s, Louisiana's capital city, Baton Rouge, was relatively small and quiet. Few of the 11,000 people who lived there could imagine the change, big change, heading their way. I like to say that the Baton Rouge has two periods of history. BSO and ASO, before Standard Oil and after Standard Oil, because 1909 changes everything for Baton Rouge. You can see where the cotton stalks are still crisscrossing the land. They didn't even bother to clear the last crop. Um, it was so urgent to go ahead and start building this refinery. Two brothers, Frank and Henry Norman Siraj, they called him Cap, knew people were going to need things. And so he and his brother opened a grocery store right there at the gates of where they were building Standard Oil, and that was the beginning of his grocery business. One grocery store turned into two. After Frank became ill, Cap took over and named the last one the Full Weight Grocery. Back in those days, everything was weighed out. There weren't things in cans or bags or anything like that. So to give full weight was really, really important, and that's why he named it that because someone would come in and say, no, don't you put that thumb on the scale. And so to say that you gave full weight really said something about your values. And he would blend roasted coffees and create these, these flavors and serve coffee to the neighbors who came to see him at the store. It was the only thing he gave them for free, but he would give them a cup of coffee. And they in turn liked the coffee so much, they started buying it from him. So he would put it into a little craft brown paper bag and sell it to them. Well, the coffee business started to grow. And so in 1919, he decided that he would focus his time on coffee and then named that coffee Community Coffee that we know today. And he named it Community after those friends and neighbors who had come to the store and visit with him. Cap sold his stores and concentrated on coffee. Particular about his blend and flavor, he brought his work home, literally, turning an old barn behind his house into a mill. His son, Henry Norman Jr., HN was his nickname, grew up doing chores and Cap's growing business. It was probably more an interest that caused him to go into coffee. I believe he liked the people that he met. Uh, he, would, he would travel to New Orleans, which from Baton Rouge, 1919 was a long way to travel uh, to purchase his coffee. And I think he, he liked them and the lifestyle around coffee. One of the distinctions about coffee drinking in New Orleans, which people who came here to the port to do business noticed was that people wanted to leave the office and have this social time together mixed with business. Back at home, Baton Rouge was growing all around them. There were suburbs and better roads and ferries. The changes added to the reach and popularity of community coffee. And a new bridge across the Mississippi River made it a lot easier to come and go. Community coffee had eight trucks on the street but what they really wanted was to be in the driver's seat in quality control. My grandfather said, you know, we could really improve our quality of this coffee if we controlled more of the aspects of quality, the roasting of the coffees, um, the selection of the coffees. And so my grandfather really brought that into the business. Cap and his sons, HN and Leonard Carey, made it a true family business, becoming partners. Their combined capital, nearly $26,000. And then World War II changed the world. Harry went off to fight in the Pacific. HN, turned away because of his eyesight, stayed behind to help run the business. On the home front, there were shortages and separations. Rationing meant reduced delivery routes, but Baton Rouge was humming with increased business and activity in the war effort. 
It's estimated that Baton Rouge is responsible for the production of 75 to 80% of all aviation fuel used in World War II by the United States. And that growth brought enormous changes to Baton Rouge. In 1944, word came. Captain Kerry Siraj would not be coming home. He had sacrificed his life to protect his men and their mission on a hill in the Solomon Islands. Things would never be the same, but Cap and HN would carry on as partners. Post-war ushered in a whole nother boom that was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. So it was a city of people that were moving in and, and new peoples, a new identity, new place. The Baton Rouge was changing drastically. Community coffee was changing as well and leaving the backyard mill behind. They needed some packaging machines. Everything was just being hand packed. So he purchased some property on Riverside North up here in Baton Rouge, right on the river and built our first plant. By 1952, Community had 84 employees and 23 trucks in their fleet. And Cap and HN wanted to try out some different marketing, some Louisiana lanyard, a little something extra. Cap and HN got the idea of putting a premium coupon on the top of every bag. And if you save these little coupons, you could get something extra. And so we had premium stores in six cities in Louisiana where you could go in and take your coupons and you could get sheets or towels or pots and pans and lamps. And we called them our premium stores. It encouraged brand loyalty and the stores were popular for years. What will it be this morning, coffee? Yes, Gracie, a cup of coffee before I start out. And then something came called television. We heard about a man named Jim Henson, just kind of out of college and going into business, and he had these funny things called Muppets. So he did some of our first TV commercials. How about a cup of community coffee? No, oh, let me have Brand X. Okay. Ooh, that's smart. It was two Muppets, and one was grumpy, and one was happy, and they were little hand puppets. And these were, these were funny 10 second commercials. And it would be like the, the grumpy one would be eating some coffee and say, yum, 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 this community coffee sure tastes good. And the happy one would say, tastes a lot better if you had boiling water. Or they would say, Oh, look at that coffee, it's cheap, 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 and a little bird would come out and say, it's not as good as community coffee. I mean, they were silly, slapstick, and people loved them. Well, of course, Jim Henson went on to be the creator of the Muppets. I forgot my parachute. How about the community coffee? I forgot that too. <laughs> You'll never forget this. With HN now at the helm, Community began dealing directly with a coffee supplier in Brazil. Like them, it was a family business. And in 1964, Community would become their first American customer. By this time, another Siraj was helping in the business, Henry Norman III. They called him Norman. Community opened a sales office in New Orleans in 1967. Hoping to break into that strong, coffee-rich market, the company offered special deals with coffee makers and its own Freshelator storage canisters. These one-gallon sealable cans showed up on a lot of kitchen counters. Expansion continued in the Baton Rouge area as well, as the company built a modern high-tech plant right along the river at Port Allen, near the new Mississippi River Bridge. But then something new began challenging the coffee market, something coffee companies hadn't faced before, waning popularity of coffee itself. Young people weren't drinking coffee. This is back in the, oh, I'd say the 60s, 70s. That was the old folks' drink. They were drinking their colas. It was before the days of coffee houses, remember. So the young people were not being enticed to drink coffee. They thought it was that awful stuff their parents brewed. 
So we wanted to figure out a way to get young people more involved in coffee and figure out a way to keep our premium program going. They looked at a trend on the West Coast where young people were buying whole bean coffee and it was gaining momentum on traditional ground coffee. So we figured out, well, we can do that. And we started what was called the Coffee Place. It was a place where we still had a premium area where you could bring in your coupons, but the big thing was this big counter of roasted whole bean coffee, even roasted chicory that you could buy and see and blend yourself. I mean, it was kind of an adventure. It didn't make a lot of money, but it sure got young people involved in coffee again. Things brightened up a bit in the early 70s. A more vibrant red color for the packaging and for the parking lot. Trucks went from green to community red. And something else was about to change. Norman had heard about this machine that was made in Switzerland that would vacuum pack a bag and make it hard to suck out all that oxygen so that it wouldn't stale so quickly. Well, no one in the U.S. had ever seen a hard bag of coffee before. This one was just like, boop, boop, it was like a brick. It was, you know, we called it a firm pack. It was definitely firm. It was hard as a brick, okay, let's face it. And so we had to do advertising that explained to the customer that it was okay if they picked up their community coffee and it was hard. Community takes the difference. Weather plays a big role in the coffee market. Sometimes we have more of a weather-driven market than other times, but absolutely weather is a huge impact in crop size. Sometimes the scariest part is getting coffee. Sometimes there's not coffee. One of the most serious crop failures happened in 1975. Widespread frost in Brazil crushed the coffee market. Well, the black frost was the famous one, and we've had some since then as well. Not enough coffee around, prices skyrocket. It, it can change the dynamic of the market really quickly. Community made it through those two and a half years of soaring prices without compromising quality and without layoffs. Guiding the company through those times was the new president and third generation owner, Norman Siraj. My dad, Norman, saw the role of the brand. He understood that the brand was kind of a badge and it identifies who you are, who you're related to. And a brand can make you very proud and a brand can crush you. Uh, so I believe he understood the role that communications, advertising, um, doing the right thing, that every decision counts, that Brands are forever, relationships uh, are earned each day. There was a stretch of time in the 80s and early 90s when family members did not agree on the company's direction, and it threatened both the brand and the future of community. We were able to, to buy their shares, have huge debt, which he had never had debt in his life, and um, my husband, he figured out a way to pay off the debt. And he figured out that if he would get all of the employees involved in a profit sharing plan, to where if everybody pitched in and the company made more money and they all shared in it, that that would probably work and the company would start earning and it worked. And to this day, there's still a profit sharing bonus plan there. That's probably as much as anything as Norman's kind of recommitment to the purpose of the company that, that, that is what it is today. It's been the thing that's really made it possible to drive the growth that they're going through and, and to make those family decisions that are, that are tough family decisions to make. Community's coffee service business in convenience stores, offices, and restaurants successfully introduced the brand and the flavor to markets across the South. And the great thing about that is it gives people a chance to interact with our brand and sample so that when we expand in there in the grocery division, they see it on the shelves and they realize they've tried it at their office or at their favorite restaurant or some other place, and they've already formed some sort of uh, relationship with the brand and so then they're more likely to buy it off the shelf. By 1995, customers in six southern states could find community coffee in their grocery store, and more doors were opening. 
That same year, Community also launched a new coffee house venture, CC's Gourmet Coffee House. The first location was in New Orleans. Many more across the region would follow. In 2005, a fourth generation took over the leadership role. Matt Siraj became president and CEO. Coffee is a very complicated business in that it is a global business. There's a lot of players and it's international rules. So uh, you have to confirm what you assume and uh, pay close attention. So that's why we go to Origin. That's why we try to get our, our boots on the ground, our hands on the land, and meet the people who are caring for the farm who can do the best job for us to produce our coffees. We go out and buy different coffee from different origins um, to kind of create that profile. So, so there are coffees that are much more big body, sweet, nutty, chocolatey driven coffees. Now we also blend that in with some coffees that bring out some different aspects of flavor, kind of bring that all together. Uh, a tree of, uh, produces somewhere between one and a half and two pounds of coffee. So it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's astronomical. You think about a lot of this coffee is hand-picked. Well, the coffee bean is not a bean. It's bean shaped, but it's actually uh, the seed. It's a seed. Two beans make a seed, and it's a seed of a coffee cherry. So the tree that produces coffee produces uh, these green cherries that turn red when they're ripe. Once picked, the beans are sorted and washed. It's a labor-intensive process where the red fruit and a pectin covering around the seed are removed. They'll wash off and make sure it's nice and clean at which point they move it out onto a drying patio and it will be dried there. A parchment-like shell protects the seed or beans until the milling process cleans and sorts the coffee by density and color, at which point it is shipped to the Port of New Orleans and then taken by truck to Community Coffee. Here in Louisiana, we prefer that smooth, chocolatey, delicious, rich flavor. So coffee starts out as a green seed. It goes into the roaster, and you'll see that green start to turn yellowish as that roasting process is mostly just evaporating out the water. Roasting takes the bean temperature to between 350 and 450 degrees Fahrenheit. That's bean temperature. The temperature inside the roaster is between 600 and 700 degrees and then you start to see it turn brown. What's happening there is the first couple of things. You start to change chemically the coffee. The coffee's, uh, you know, browning of proteins and browning of sugar, and then you start to get some of the sweetness coming out and even as some acidic notes as, as that coffee starts to burn off some acids and the coffee basically puffs up, doubles in size. Really, coffee before that point is not palatable. That's when the real roast starts to happen and that's when those oils and lipids um, start to come out of the coffee, and that would be considered a dark roast at that point in time. Coffee cupping is, is a coffee tasting, and so it's attended by maybe three people, three individuals. Never, No one ever cups coffee alone. Uh, you always want to have somebody with you because uh, we all taste different things. It's done at least weekly, and at least one Siraj family member is always at the table. There's a standard form for recording different aspects of the coffee. So, you know, we want to evaluate how's the aroma, how is the flavor, how's the body of the coffee. And body would be you know, the weight of the coffee on your palate. Is it heavy or is it light? And acidity, and acidity is brightness. It's, it's not tartness, it's really brightness of the coffee. And then aftertaste, what's your memory of it? Is it pleasant? Okay, so uh, I think we're ready to start. So. Yeah, the taste of coffee is probably uh, fun to watch. It, it certainly is fun to listen to. To taste the coffee, you want to sip it very quickly and, and with lots of air into, into your mouth and so that you can, uh, it sprays the coffee across your taste buds. And through that experience, you can pick up uh, defects, subtle tastes, things that nuances you may not actually experience just drinking a cup of coffee, but it is part of that coffee. After they've all tasted and graded every sample, then they talk and make the final decision about accepting or rejecting the shipments. I really like this coffee. This coffee had both acidity and body, um, good balance between the two. Like I got a, a, a hazelnut note. Mm -hmm. uh, buttery. Yeah, buttery in there, and like nice. a, this wow. hazelnut note which uh, would like just... I did the nutty. same thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But I couldn't put it in the terms what it was. I actually put celery. I, I couldn't get it, but it was hazelnut. <laughs> <laughs> At the cupping table, you're making decisions usually 
uh, around 40 to half a million pounds of coffee at a time. So the cupping exercise is, is very particular. Wow. This is really, really good. While the cupping is always done with black coffee, flavors are an important part of today's coffee market. And actually, one particular flavor has been a part of community coffee from those beginning years. So chicory, huh. so, so chicory um, is a root of the endive plant. So some people may have heard of the Belgian endives. It is a relation to the dandelion. And so this root traditionally was used in Europe probably before, but the first big time was during the Napoleonic Wars. The French at this time fell in love with, they were in love with coffee and they couldn't get their coffee. Well, someone came along and they started roasting chicory root and mixing it with their coffee. Years later, it came to the United States in our French population in New Orleans. So there was obviously a tradition there of having it, but then we had the Civil War. The port of New Orleans was being blockaded by the North. And so again, the folks of the South couldn't get their coffee, so they started using chicory again and they're growing it. It's kind of a sweet, pungent flavor. It's kind of a difficult flavor to describe. It's caramely, it's sweet, but it's also got this pungency to it. It actually pairs really well with coffee. Chicory has no caffeine. The rest of the coffee is almost always a dark roast when you pair it with chicory. And that heating that happens in order to make the dark roast destroys the caffeine. So if you have dark roast coffee that has less caffeine and you have chicory which has no caffeine, you're having a very low dose of caffeine when you have a cup of coffee and chicory. And I think that's one of the reasons we developed such a coffee culture because we were able to drink it all day. In today's culture though, what's behind the coffee needs to rival the taste. Taking care of the customer for sure, but also taking care of the people and the land behind the brand. There's over 25 million families involved in coffee farming around the world. So it's a people business, it's a family business. You have to care about sustaining not only the agriculture, but sustaining the culture of the community that grows the coffee. People want to support a brand that they can connect with and believe in. And if you're doing good for someone somewhere, whether it be in your local community or somewhere around the world, they can connect to that brand and that matters today. And the neat thing is, is that we were all about community before being part of the community was maybe cool. So it's something that's always been part of our DNA is giving back. And, and whether it's uh, education support, military support, first responder support, disaster relief, that's always been part of what we do. In a lot of ways, um, we think about some of the greatest companies are those companies that have this conscious capitalism. They, they think about their service to community, their service to people as part of their, their purpose. The interesting thing about the family giving is that it's very focused on achieving a social benefit without any reflected glory. But when the company gives, they would like for the consumers of their product to know that they're doing this good work and these are their values. National awareness of the brand really took off a few years ago when Community got on board with a new partnership. Community began to be the preferred coffee on Southwest Airlines. A lot more folks get to try it, but it was also just a sense of pride as a state that our coffee company was in that space. Southwest, the seventh most admired brand globally, over 50,000 associates. For them to partner with us, they had never done this before. They had never co-branded with anyone on their flights. For them to put our logo in conjunction with theirs on a cup on their flight spoke volumes. We love seeing the pictures from our consumers, the little picture of the coffee cup with our logo on it saying, I found you on, on the plane. Every taste helps in this changing coffee market. Competition from established companies and micro-roasters require thinking outside of the cup. We're not just your grandma's coffee, we're just maybe a traditional uh, ground coffee and your drip coffee maker every morning. Today in grocery, the single serve format is about half of the sales in the grocery store. You have a lot of consumers that want to try new things and try new offerings and, and more than just a different blend or a different flavor, but an actual different format. But now we're seeing coffee that's being eaten, coffee gum, coffee candy bars, coffee breakfast bars. So I think you know, coffee's got a long runway ahead of it uh, in, as far as innovation, but it's driven by understanding that consumer. 
Staying family does not mean staying stagnant or staying small. From one man a century ago, this community has grown to be one of the top-selling family-owned retail coffee brands in America. I rarely meet anyone who doesn't like coffee. They'll always say, if they don't drink it, I love the smell of it, but I never learn to drink it. Uh, sometimes I'll say, well, one day you'll grow up and learn how. <laughs> I can say that at my age now. <laughs> After 100 years of getting up early to make the coffee, community is still at it. Our values started at the kitchen table. There are simply just the values that the family believed in, you know, integrity and honesty and do a job well. We call that quality. You know, take care of other people, that's safety. You know, our values are something that we really believe in and show every day. It was a big step for Cap Siraj all those years ago, counting on family and friends, he built a company and left a legacy that included them all. I'd say his vision first was, I hope, I hope this survives through my children's lifetimes. But here we are 100 years later, and the fifth generation is now starting to enter the business and learn about it. I think that there is no limit to what this company can be, and that these future generations are going to take it farther than I could even dream as I think the company is farther than Cap Siraj ever dreamed it could be. I've always wondered if an entrepreneur really sees the future, uh, or if they just see it maybe in the eyes, in their own eyes, or the eyes of their children. So I, I can't speak about whether Cap really saw the future of the company as much as he saw what it meant to him and his family and his neighbors and those who enjoyed his product. And I think that was enough to motivate him to, to try his best and just see what happens.